And uh, so we're in this chapter called Variation Forms, which is really, it, which is also known as theme in variation. Um, the last class, which was Thursday, we, uh, we didn't discuss the chapter. We only, uh, we went and looked at a piece of music called uh, Vari uh, Brahms as Variation on a Theme by Haydn. And apparently he has two different ones of those, a piano one and then an orchestra one. Um, and in the in our in our book, it's uh, an orchestra piece. Uh, but anyway, it's just a, a introduction on what's going on here. Um, I don't have a lot of room here, so I have to sh sh switch things around all the time. Um, so the, look, the variation form is um, it probably says that right down here somewhere. Um, yeah, s somewhere. But just listen. Um, variation form is the oldest formalized musical plan to remain in consistent use from its origin until the present day. In other words, they still do this theme and variation. So variation form means you have a theme. And then you have variations of the theme, okay? And uh, often, but not always, you have a, um, a repeat of the theme at the end, which is often called the reprise. Um, hi, Mr. Greer, how are you doing? I'm good, are you? I'm good, thank you. I got you down for attendance along with uh, Mr. Neal. Okay, so... So variations, or theme and variation, it just calls it variation forms, for, variations form, um, but it's really, again, theme and variation, because uh, you have to have a theme to make some variations off of it. And it derives from the concept of repetition, which is, which is what we keep talking about, repetition. Instead of exact repetitions, we have composers would vary them. They would make them different, okay? There are two types of uh, variation form forms, okay? That's probably why he calls the chapter variation forms. It, 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 it's still, the two types still have some sort of theme and then some sort of variation on it. Um, but the one with, that's called, there's one called theme and variation and the other one is called ostinato variations, all right? So, Theme and variation is the one that would have the reprise more than necessarily the ostinato variations, but you'll find it in both most likely. Um, so, Roman numeral one, theme and variations. All right, so theme and variations, the general characteristics of a theme and variation. Uh, first of all, it can be just a plain independent composition. All right. So um, it could just be an independent composition that you can, that, that was just written for that, or it's part of a multi-movement work or a movement within a multi-movement work, like a sonata or um, a, uh, a symphony or something like that, an orchestra piece, all right? Um, you find a lot of uh, theme and variations written for piano also. Um, and it, it might be part of a, a piano sonata, all right? Um, the theme is rarely less than about eight measures. This is right here, by the way. Sorry. Uh, I'm right here in this paragraph right here. Um, the theme is rarely less than eight measures and usually not more than 32, although you will find some that are longer. Um, the theme is normally a complete entity, all right? In other words, the theme can be taken, just the plain theme can be taken out of the theme and variation and just played as a short little piece. And we actually um, kind of hear things like that uh, in our recital. Sometimes 
we get like somebody will just play the theme of something, all right? Or they'll play the theme in variation three or something like that in our recitals. Um, but the theme normally is a complete entity in himself and it comes to a full close and so it can stand alone. So in, in theme and variation, you always have a complete closure at the end. All right. Now it might be a little blurred by some other things like how composers have, you know, blurred the, the seams of phrases and periods and things like that, but it still comes to a complete close. Um, the overall form of theme and variation is highly sectionalized. So you have sections, you have the theme, then you have like variation one, variation two, so on and so forth. And so we call it sectionalized, all right? That's an important thing to understand. It's sectionalized, all right? Um, the overall form of the theme and variation, well, I already said that. Variation can be applied to any of these following uh, musical elements, harmony, melody, and structure. The harmony, the, the melody is, is, a, is a big one. Uh, that they they just put the same melody in there and they um, litter it with non-chord tones and, and things like that. But you could change the accompaniment pattern, even the rhythmic pattern. You could put figuration, texture, articulation. You could change the instrumentation. That would be considered a variation. So if you had an orchestra, it could be like a small trio playing or in the band, a small trio playing. And then the next variation is the same thing except the whole orchestra is playing. All right. So or the whole band is playing. Oh, you could change the key, all right? And, and it's not uncommon to change the mode. If you're in uh, C major, just change the mode to C minor, all right? You, uh, the tempo, you could vary the tempo. Um, some of these later ones are kind of like, um, uh, usually combined with other ones. Um, tempo, meter, dynamics, register, all right? Um, so you get a lot of changing of register in the marching band and things like that, all right? Um, and I'm not an expert on marching band like uh, probably the three of you, all right? So, okay, so um, right here, harmony, melody, and structure are fundamental importance, all right? Um, when one of these basic elements is retained in the variation, it is said to be fixed, all right? We have fixed variations. Um, so um, harmonically fixed is if just the basic harmonic framework is, is fixed. It's the, exactly the same, and the melody is completely different, all right? So that's what harmonically fixed means. Melodically fixed is, uh, the melody is, is at least there and recognizable. And I'll be honest with you, sometimes it's not very recognizable. You gotta go through and find the notes, all right? So it's, it's, it's not that easy sometimes. Or it just is structurally fixed. It has the same structure, all right? But it doesn't have the harmonic portion of it the same or the melodic portion of the same, but the same structure. And the structure would be how many measures it is, all right? Is it in two parts? You have part one and part two, but that's the structure, all right? Um, so these things came along. Let, let, me, let me just rephrase this now a little bit. Harmonically and melodically fixed. We really have four types of ways that, we, that are most common. Something that is harmonically and melodically fixed, variation. That also means that the structure is fixed. It's understood that it is understood that the structure is fixed, but we don't say the structure is fixed because we understand it. Or something that is just number two, harmonically fixed. That means if the harmony is there, the very the the structure is there also. All right, so so it's it's the same. What it's missing is it's got a new melody, or it could be melodically fixed which means the structure is still fixed, all right, because the melody goes along with the same chords or parts, and, but, it, but the harmony is different, all right? 
So um, then the last one is just plain structurally fixed, which means neither the harmony nor the melody is fixed. And these are important concepts to understand here. Uh, these are the four most common things that happen, all right? And I would say number one happens a lot. Uh, number three happens a lot. And of course, number two happens too, but I don't think it happens as much. It really depends on what we're looking at. But right now we're talking about theme and variations as opposed to ostinato variations, all right? So we have these individual uh, um, it, dances in the Baroque period and they, they were, Sometimes one or more variation, they call them doubles, okay? The beginning of each dance in a double is shown in example 7-1. All right, so 7-1, let's see. I'm gonna play this for you. Give me a chance to find it. And uh, here we go, I hope. So I'm going to play this again. Understand that he only gives the first four measures of an eight, an eight measure thing. So we listen to four measures and then we have to listen to the rest of that. And then the double comes along and it's a variation. And all right, let me not there. Here we go again. Oh man, everything keeps getting in the way of, of doing things. Here we go. All right, now here's the next eight measures. Because that was a half cadence for the next four measures. Here's the double. So when we take a look at this, uh, if, if you just look at the bass line, the bass line is very similar, okay? Um, we have the opening two notes, then we have this note right here followed by some other things here. Then we have this chord right here, which is generally this chord right there. Um, you can see the C natural, and we have this walking bass line that goes down and then chromatically moves up to there. So uh, at least, the harmony is probably fixed. Now, let's just take a quick look here and see if we can find uh, the melody in it, all right? There's the F, see the F? And I'm just looking at the top notes. Uh, there's the E, and uh, there's the F right there, and here's the G, and if we went on, we would probably find all the notes. So in theory, although this is called the double, it seems to be harmonically and melodically fixed. Does everybody understand that? Yeah. Cool. All right. All right, so there's another uh, example down here. Uh, now this is Haydn. Uh, so this is, uh, uh, this is a theme in variation 10. Um, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I don't have this and, and the reason would be 
is coming up with variation 10 in, in my simple way of doing things. Come on, move back. Uh, well, I do have something here, so let's play the beginning of this. pasted that together but the, really the intent of this is to take a look at this uh, I, between the, the two of them we, we basically have this uh, a major chord and this is really projecting a major all right and then uh, this is uh, if I look up here this is uh, some chord some sort of dominant chord E G sharp and B all right uh, here, here's here's the G's down here uh, here's an E uh, it basically is the same harmony, all right. And if we went and if we went through this all, we would find the same harmony, basically, all right. So it's definitely harmonically fixed. But when I look for the melody, I'm looking for a pair of E's here, and I don't, I don't, I see an E right there, uh, but I don't really see these notes. Do you see what I'm saying? Yes, no, maybe. Yes, sir. Okay, so. Oh, uh, I got somebody new voice I hadn't heard before. All right, Mr. Hubbard's here. Um, anyways, um, so so this is this is an example of something that is harmonically fixed, which also means it's structurally fixed, but it's not melodically fixed. All right. Okay, so let's see about Haydn String Quartet. I'm sure I have this one. This one is a very nice piece. Let's uh, uh, this this by the way is is uh, is from the Emperor Quartet, which is really one of his famous quartets, and it's Opus seventy six number three. It actually says that in the book, um, and I want you to understand that Haydn, along with Beethoven, wrote a ton of string quartets. So uh, a lot of them are, are by name, like, you know, string quartet and G major or something like that. You might've written five of them. So you really always have to come up with the opus number and the number it is, all right? But this one is known as the Emperor String Quartet. Okay, so let's uh, take a listen to this for a second here. Let's see. should be variation four right here. All right, so let's just take a look at this. Um, so, um, the, the problem with sometimes the, the, the examples that are given are that uh, they're, they're, this is only a, a small portion of it. I'm pretty sure this is an eight measure um, phrase uh, or theme here, but he's only giving the first four measures. And it clearly ends on the dominant chord here. We're in the key of G major. He even says that here. And it clearly ends on the dominant chord. All right. So, um, uh, 
So again, the, the last example we looked at was just harmonically fixed. And let's take a, a careful, more careful look at this one. All right. Um, if I if I think about it, th this is this is a G chord right here. All right. You see this chord right here? This is a uh, you know, it's like E, G, and B at the sixth chord, all right? Um, and and uh, although this, this is a D in this bass here, and, and we have a, 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 a D, an A, and a C with an F sharp and an A down here, um, what happens is he changes the melody or the har harmony right here, all right? And it, and it says, this variation with emphasis on the submediate triad, which is the six, all right, is harmonized differently from, uh, from the theme. Uh, about half of the beats in the variation are reharmonized, all right? So there's a little chart he has here, measure one, two, three, and four. So I'm going to just make this a little bit, let me see if I can do this. Give me a chance here. Um, command minus. All right. Can you still see it all? Not the whole chart. Okay, you can't see this very bottom of the chart. Oh, no. I oh, think the West, I think, G. Uh, yeah. Variation. G. Yeah, this is the chart. When yeah. We're all the four measures. Yeah, yeah see I had, it. No, I had to move my screen. All right, so. Let me see if I can, uh, uh, it won't let me zoom by pressing in some other number here. So let me try another way. I, I, I fixed it on my screen. I had to zoom myself out. All right. Okay. All right. So anyways, if we just look at the chart, instead of a one chord, we have a six right here. All right. Then we have a seven circle of five. That's this right here. Seven circle six, sorry. Moving, moving to uh, five, all right? So let's figure out where that five is. Uh, seven circle six, and that's a half circle six. Uh, that would have to be where that C sharp is. And if I look at, what the five chord is supposed to be. Um, oh, it's just a seven circle six of five. All right. That's what this is. And it, but we don't go to five. We go to the one, six, four, and then we go to the five as opposed to the one and the five, six, which the harmony is basically still the same here. But what happens is the harmony again changes in this uh, first measure here again, and it keeps going on. Um, sometimes these charts are hard to read. Then you can see that we have a 5-7, but we have a 5-7 of 4. So 5-7 of 4 is a major chord with a minor 7th on it. And you can look for that in measure 2. 1, 2, right here. Um, and so we're looking for G. It's G. Uh, I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. I'm looking for it. Hmm. Um, let's uh, let's avoid that for the moment because I am having problems with that because this says example seven four. Yeah, the chart. All right, all right. So let's just look for this. Uh, we're supposedly looking for a G B D and F natural. All right, but I don't see it. Do you? Right here. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't see an F natural anywhere. All right. Oh, a five seven of six. I'm sorry, it's not a five seven of four. It's a five seven of six. So it'd be built on the three chord, and the three chord is uh, B, uh, D sharp, F sharp, and A. So we do have that. Here's B, D sharp, F sharp, and A. Do you see that? Yes, so. So is the melody there? Now oh, look, here's the melody. The melody is basically all there. So this is melodically fixed, which means the structure is fixed. 
but it's not harmonically fixed. So everybody got that? Yes, sir. All right, so here's terms, all right? And I just want you to know, I've normally always uh, done things separately. Uh, each question separately, and I do that because people skip questions. Uh, but this one, I didn't do it like that. And there's a reason for this, all right? I'm just gonna tell you this, right here, between question 10, 11, 12, and 13. They are tricky to answer. All of this material is compacted into about three sentences, all right, in the beginning of ostinato variations. So I'm just telling you this. That's why I left them open so you can go back and make comparisons, all right? Because I had, when I had them separate, I had to keep going back to make sure I was getting the right one, just so you know, all right? So this is the reason I left it open, and I'm telling you that these four questions are hard. You have to thoroughly read that area right there, all right? Okay, so I've uh, covered up through page 252. So what I really wanna do now is actually um, um, I'm gonna reshare a screen and we're gonna talk about a, a, a different piece of music. We talked about um, Haydn's theme, or Brahms's variations on a theme by Haydn, which is also known as St. Anthony's Chorale. Uh, so now what I want to do is I want to do a, another piece of music. Let's see. Mm. This one right here. The, the, this book does a lot with Ostinato. Uh, and, and the chapter goes on and on and on about various things, all right? Um, but it doesn't do enough with just plain theme and variation, I, I, I'm in, under the opinion. So let me ask you this, do you see, um, something that's in Russian up here? It says Aria right here, and Stima, that's the theme, all right? This is the Goldberg variations, all right? And let's just take a quick look at what's going on, all right, first of all. And I'm looking for repeat signs, all right? There's a repeat sign right there. And there's a repeat sign there that goes back to here as opposed to going to the beginning. So, and then after that we have variation one, all right? So we probably have two part form. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm just doing that by the repeat signs, all right? So, so then I look at this, and I, I picked this score in particular because, in general, it has four measures to a, uh, a, a system. Uh, some of these don't, and, you, and, and people get confused. And I just feel that it's better. It, it, here, it doesn't have four measures because there's too many notes, all right? But it still sticks the whole thing on this first page. Um, so... I think about a G, it starts on a G, all right? And uh, look at this, this is a D, all right? That's the dominant, right? Yes, no, maybe. Mm -hmm. In the key of D, mm -hmm. it's D. So when I listen to it, I'm gonna kind of listen to see if this is a half cadence, all right? Um, then I'm going to measure eight, this is a G, and this is a D, so that's probably five one. And it really cadence is right here. Um, probably a perfect authentic case, all right? So then I want you to notice that immediately here I get C sharp, C sharp, uh, C sharp, C sharp, probably have modulated, because there's that accidental, which is what's the dominant key of G? D. D, what's the key signature of D? Uh, F sharp and C sharp. Right. So we have F sharp in the key signature, we have a bunch of C sharps. And these C sharps, they sort of disappear right here. All right, this is, would be a non-chord tone, but they come right back here, right back here. And look at this, they're right here. We end on a D. More than likely, we've modulated, okay?
okay? Mm -hmm. So the last thing I'm gonna ask you here is what are the two predominant chords? Um, and I don't want the name of the chord like G major or E minor or whatever they are. Uh, I just want, to, it, one is the four. Does anyone know what the other one is? The chord that comes before five is the four. They're both built on scale degree four. One is the four. What's the other one? The other one's two six. But generally we can say four and two are the most common chords in the new key. But what do they transverse to in the old key? So if we're in D, what's the two chord? E, e minor. E. Yeah, yeah, E minor. When what's the the four chord? Of E? Of E. The four of chord D. of E is A. Uh, of D as in dog. Oh, the four chord of D is G. Is G. I might have said that wrong. So I got the the two chord is um, is E minor and the four chord is G major. Those are the two pivot chords. This is how you pivot into a new key. All right. And I'm going to just tell you the pivot is right here. It's at the very beginning. We start with the G chord and that G chord becomes the four chord and boom, we have some sort of variation of the five chord and uh, the five chord in D major is what? A. A. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So here we got a, it looks like some sort of five, four, two chord because this is a four. Uh, this is a suspension. This is a, uh, see how it suspends down here? And it's, it's not my intent to go off into exactly what all the particulars here, but my intent was to say, well, then here we got a perfect authentic cadence in D, all right? Is it open or closed? Is this part open or closed? Oh, okay. Open. It's not in the original, it's not in the home key. Right, right. And I'm, I'm, I'm shoving back these points because these are so important, all right? Part two, one, two, three, four, I'm probably gonna look for a cadence here, all right? One, two, three, four, I'm probably gonna look for a cadence here. One, and it's, you know, and one, two, three, four, it, probably and two, two, three, four is gonna be a cadence. One, two, three, four is gonna be a cadence because it's probably gonna be structurally fixed. Now that is, as long as, well, no, I, I yeah. It's probably gonna be the same, all right? And I'm not gonna go over this mess here. First, I'm gonna play it. All right, now we are not taking the repeats, all right? You're gonna play it straight through, okay? All right, let's see. Um, you are still looking at the score, right? Right, you're still looking at the score. Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. I just wanna make sure that I'm gonna press play and you see the score. Here we go, play. I think I paused it on this note, just so you know, we're going on to the second section. So how many people just, you know, think it's, uh, you got four cadences or you got two cadences or how many cadences you got? So anybody? I mean, how many sounded, sounded like four to me. I think mm -hmm. four also. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. What about Carl? You said, yeah. I, yeah, I think so too. Um, 
because I once I heard two half cadence and then I heard two, it started to complete. Yeah. Um, uh, Mr. Greer, what did you hear? Uh -huh. How about Samuel, what did you hear? Uh -huh. <clears throat> All right, I'm not gonna worry about it. Uh, this is typically what happens in my class anyways. All right, so we all we all agree there's probably four cadence. This is a half cadence. This is a perfect authentic cadence in the tonic key or the home key. All right, this is a half cadence, A, C sharp, and E. All right, now there is a seventh here, all right? Um, but it's just a, you could say it's an upper neighbor, all right, or something like that. Um, Oh, but it but it is a, a a five chord in general, and then this is a five one, a scale degree four, moving to scale degree five, moving to scale degree one. All right. Um, and I want you to notice that this is a structural progression. This is one six. This is either four or two. I'm just basing it on this. This is a two six chord. All right. This is five one. All right, structural progression. All right, here we go. We are, uh, we should be right on this downbeat of 17. Um, here we go. the closure all right the aria can be just all by itself this is called an aria but it's the theme all right um, Bach calls it aria and he plays it again at the very end after 32 variations uh, he plays the aria at the end and it's called the reprise okay now I realize we're running out of time here so I am going to play you this right here and um, might not be able to scroll fast enough. I'm warning you, it goes fast. This is variation one. Sounds a lot different, doesn't it? Yes, no. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I want you to know it's harmonically and melodically fixed. All right. Mm -hmm. Um that goes on with a whole bunch of other variations. And so one time we we analyzed the, the there's a section where he plays them in minor. And so the, the big question from my students was: well, is is it harmonically fixed? And I didn't know what the answer was. So I wrote the guy, which I know actually, uh, one of the two people that wrote our book. I didn't choose this book. This book was already in use when I came here, just so you know. Uh, but I did study with this guy for probably a year or so. And um, I never knew he even wrote the book. So I wrote him and he said, 
Well, if it's just a change of mode and you're keeping the same chords, even though they're of different qualities, he would, he would say that it is still harmonically fixed. All right. We're using the same chord. The quality of the chords change. The sixth chord is lower. The two chord is diminished as opposed to minor, et cetera. Okay. So uh, we might listen to one more variation of this and then we'll continue with the book. Uh, please do the terms. All right. Does anyone have any questions? No. Wait a minute. I got, I got five over three minutes, right? Okay. Now listen, so I really need you to understand the composition project. If you do not have a grade in stage one of the composition, you are still on stage one. Most everybody, but not everybody does not have a grade. And, and, and the reason is, is they didn't follow the directions. All right. So there's things they got to do. There's suggest most people wrote 16 measures for stage one and the directions clearly said eight measures. And then they turned in 32 measures for stage two, but they're still on stage one. I need you to go back to your stage one and make sure you have a grade. Cause if you don't have a grade, you need to go back and see what I said about it. And if you haven't started stage one, um, you need to start it. Okay. I, I really, really mean it. So Carl and who's here? Let's see. Oh, Mr. Hubbard, Mr. Greer, Mr. Carter, Mr. Neal, you all need to work on that. All right. I need you to do that. All right. Okay. So relax. This isn't difficult. This is, this is about concentrating on making a melody. The left hand is can. All right. And in stage one, you don't have a left hand. You have whole notes in the bass, whole notes. So you can only have one chord of measure. I specifically did that so you can use a canned ry rhythm. All right. Canned left hand. All right. So I need you to start working on this, please. Uh, and if you're having any trouble, contact me in Canvas. I'll get back to you. I'll help you with it. All right. If we need to uh, maybe set up a video conference to discuss where we're at, I think we need to do that. All right. So, you know, so it would be really great if you did something like send me a message in Canvas that said, I just turned in stage two, because otherwise I have to go look for it. It doesn't, it doesn't tell me you did that or a re, you know, you can resubmit or I just resubmitted stage one. So I can go and look at it uh, with, within a reasonable amount of time and then get back with you. And maybe we can set up a short video conference to really discuss what's going on. All right, please. I want to help you. I want to show you, where is this? And I always did this in the past by individually talking to everybody about their composition. All right. And I still want to do that. Again, the composition is about writing a melody. And I'm not asking for a super suspect, uh, great melody, but I'm asking for a melody that then you can make variations from, so on and so forth. So I'm going to be, it says I'm introducing stage three, and I'm going to be introducing stage three probably Thursday. Thursday. All right. But again, if you're not on stage three, don't do stage three. Because I'll be honest with you, you can't do stage two without getting stage one right. And then you can, and then, so you can't do, and then you have to get stage two right in order to move on to stage three. Okay. All right. Have a good day, everybody. Please contact me through Canvas if you have any questions. Okay. All right. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Uh, let's see, I had Hubbard. session.